Alright, so enough about that. Free soloing. What's our next? Yeah, okay, I love this. Rating the difficulty of a rock climb. Now, we, we touched on this a little bit. A level 9 climber, a level 10 climber. Uh, what does that all mean? Every country really does have their own difficulty scale, for the most part. Um, you know, countries in Europe kind of share one of uh, a scale, the Fontainebleau scale that the French came up with, of course. Um, in America, we use what we call the Yosemite Decimal System, um, named after, well, you know, I don't even have to explain that, but, you know, that's hallowed ground to us, so we named our scale after it. Um, it's really, a, it's a scale for terrain, all terrain, right? So, if we're hiking, there's, that's, that's a class of terrain, class one, class two, class three. Um, if you're walking on a flat sidewalk, that would be class one terrain. Um, you start to get into class two terrain when that sidewalk is in San Francisco at, you know, Knob Hill, and it's, it goes up, right? So, and you might have some ankle turners, some big rocks, you know, you might have to watch out for that. You start to get into class two terrain. Class three is uh, a little bit, it's where you start to get into what we call scrambling. You know, you may have to put your hands down every now and then. Uh, you might have to go up and over a large-ish boulder uh, to get up and over it or some other obstacle. And then class four, scrambling, uh, pretty much constant use of hands. Uh, it's not just hiking anymore. Your grandmother might feel like she needs a rope, you know, to feel safe doing it. You might not if you're, uh, an, if you're an accomplished climber and you're on class four terrain, you probably don't feel the need for a rope yet. Class 5 terrain, I've highlighted that. This is where technical rock climbing lives. Actually, specifically, free climbing. Now, remember we talked about free climbing. That's just using hands and feet. You do still have ropes and such, but they're there just as a safety net. You're only using your hands and feet to make physical progress up the cliff. That's what we call free climbing. And that's, that's what we call class 5 terrain in the Yosemite scale. Okay? I've highlighted class 5. And what it basically means is that we've got different, within class five, we've got different subdivisions. 5.1, 5.2, 5.3, and it goes up from there, right? A lot. So, uh, and we'll have a chart for that here in just a second. But that's how we rate the difficulty of free climbs. Now, to give you a content, now we don't say 5.3. We don't say 5.9. Um, just so you know, uh, we're going to just kind of help you with your lingo so you don't sound like a, what we call a Gumby. Um, or a newcomer, you know, uh, or somebody who's just, whatever. Um, we don't say it that way. We say 5'9", 5'10", 5'7", 5'8". That's how we say it. We might even just say, you know, hey, did you climb that 8 last weekend? We might even just drop the 5 off altogether. The 5 is understood, but a lot of times you'll hear it said, but it can be just understood, you know. Um, to give you a context for it, well, actually, I'll do that on the next slide. Class 6 terrain, that's where aid climbing is. And uh, aid climbing goes from like, you know, A1, A2, A3. Um, up to A3, it's pretty sane, um, aid climbing is. Past A3, you start to get into real sketchy pieces of uh, gear placements with real malleable types of metal, um, real tiny, shallow grooves that you're just kind of pounding these things into. And it's much more insecure placements that you're relying upon. Um, the, the difficulty grades in class six terrain, um, A0 through A6, the difficulty or the, the scale of it for difficulty has a whole lot more to do with danger than it does physical difficulty. Um, and past A3, it's pretty dangerous. Um, but once again, uh, just, just a note about danger real quick. There's a lot of safe ways to climb. You can top rope climb, you can clip bolts. There's a lot of safe things that you can do in climbing. Uh, aid climbing past A3 uh, or really even at A3, not one of those things. If you're doing that, you're one of those people who's attracted to the danger the adventure and climbing is an adventure for you, right? If climbing is just fitness for you or if climbing is something you do as a hobby, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. There's also nothing wrong with somebody who likes to do it for an adventure too. So um, try not to judge somebody as risky if they do those things or people who just want more adventure in their lives and you can take that approach to it or not, right? So that's aid climbing. All right, so let's talk about class five. What does it mean? Class 5 is what you're going to see in climbing gyms, and when you go out, outdoor climbing, you're going to read your guidebook, and your guidebook is going to tell you how difficult a certain climb that you want to do is. If, if you're a 5'7 climber, you, know, you might go to the cliffs looking for 5'7s to do, because you don't want to fall that day. If you want to push yourself, you're going to look for the 5'8s in the guidebook, right? <coughs> 
So this is the utility, the usefulness of the grading, the rating system. It allows you to do these things. Now, this is, you know, my own personal opinion. Well, I, I don't know. It's pretty well borne out by how we how we grade things um, in the climbing community generally. Five zero to five five. You know, pretty much pretty much anybody could do that. You know, un, un, unless they're 150 pounds overweight, most people could climb five zero to five five. Most people could do that with no experience whatsoever. Five six and five seven. That's uh, the way I say that. Reasonably fit beginners on their first day could probably on-site those, 5'6", five, 5'7". Five, they could probably on-site those if, if they're reasonably fit, okay? 5'8", uh, and 5'9", these are your weekenders, what we call recreational climbers. Um, they don't spend a lot of dedicated time training in a climbing gym during the week, for example. Um, they just go out on the weekends once or twice a month or more. Probably those people are climbing 5.8s, maybe 5.9s, if, if they've got a lot of fitness from some other sport like CrossFit or running or cycling or something like that, uh, weightlifting, what have you. Now, uh, to get into the double digits, 5.10, to get into the double digits really does take specialized training, uh, specific training. Coming into the climbing gym, I would say two times a week as a minimum, and then also climbing on the weekends. Uh, if you pretty much spend most of your weekends climbing outdoors and you're in the climbing gym hanging out with your friends and training twice a week that really is going to be necessary for you to break into the 510s and i don't care how fit you are that's going to be true because climbing is a real specialized fitness and you're going to have to train for climbing specifically to get to the double digits of difficulty which is 510. now to further confuse you um, once we get into the double digits we now have letter grades attached to the difficulty. So we've got 510A, 510B, 510C, and 510D, okay? After 510D, we go ahead and make that jump to 511, and it'll be a 511A. Then we've got 511B, 511C, 511D, and then we jump to 512, okay? If you think that's confusing, go to Britain. <laughs> and look at the British scale for rating a difficulty, the difficulty of a rock climb. It'll make you feel a lot better about ours. All right, so um, just to give you some context, once again, 510 climbers, intermediate level, whether it's 510 or 5D, you know, anywhere in that range, right? That's what we consider the intermediate level, solidly intermediate if you are on siding anything between, consistently on siding between 510A and 510D, we consider that intermediate level climbing. Um, if you're on siding 11A to 11D, as in Delta, okay, that's what we consider advanced climbing. And if you're on siding 512A and harder, we consider you expert, elite, or open. Now, those are kind of interchangeable terms. Um, I won't go too much more into that. National class climbers, you know, are on siding in the easy 513s. You know, you might hear this called 513 minus, 513A, 513B, right? They're on siding that level that you could call that person a national level climber. And then you, you do have people who on site in the 514 range. Yeah, no kidding. Like first time ever looking at it, they walk up, they rope up, and they go to the top um, on their first try at the 514 difficulty level. That's crazy hard and crazy talent and lots and lots of training. Um, and, and these are world-class climbers who are on siting at that level. Uh, just to tell you how, how high does the scale go, how deep does the rabbit hole go, um, it goes up right now, today, it goes up to 515C. There's one climb in the whole world that's rated 515C, and there are only two humans, and I use the term marginally to call them humans. Um, there's two people who've succeeded on that one rock climb that's rated that, okay, 515C. So um, that gives you some context for what the difficulty is all about. Oh, and the last thing about difficulty, when you start talking about letter grades, I want you to know, going from 10A to 10B, that is a full grade of difficulty in jump. It's not just a shade of a grade. A lot of people don't understand that. Going from 10A to 10B, that's the same amount of jump as going from 5A to 5'9". So if you've got a 510, if you've got a 59 recreational climber climbing with a 512A climber, <laughs> you could have 12 grades of difference between the two of you. 
as far as your difficulty ability. I mean, pretty extreme. And like I say, it goes up to 15C. So that just tells you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All right. Um, no, we don't need to say much more about grades. We've talked enough about that. Trad climbing, I think we've, we've talked about this. But here's a good picture of Stephen Hong doing one of the harder traditional climbs in the world. Uh, I have kind of made it sound like all the hardest climbs are protected with bolts. Not necessarily. There are some very, very difficult 514 traditional lead climbs where you're actually placing the gear as you go, as well as just clipping the bolts. And that's, that's some serious business. Uh, good placement. Uh, kind of important to say this. Um, the gear that you place into the rock, that gear is only as good as the quality of the rock that you placed it in and as good as your own personal ability. All right, there's one example. Here's another example. He's placing this gear into the rock, right? That placement that he just placed, its ability to catch him if he takes a fall is only as good as the quality of the rock how well he read the rock and chose the right kind of placement, the right piece off of his uh, gear rack down here, and how well he placed it, how well he oriented the angle of pull. I mean, there's a million things that factor into this. And let me tell you something about this too. Um, there is no certification card that qualifies you to, to be a lead climber. It's not like scuba diving where you have to have uh, a certification card from YMCA to go get your tanks filled. Uh, at any scuba shop. Climbing is not like that. We still, we're one of the last places on earth that still has this weird ethic of personal responsibility and you're responsible for yourself and the choices that you make. So it, it is legal, not smart, but it is legal for you to take your credit card, go down to REI and buy everything you need to go climb Everest or to climb this crack outdoors. You don't have to have hired a guide, gotten a certification card, any of those things to go off and do that. <clears throat> Having said that, not the smartest thing you could do. You, 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 you might be nominated for a, a recipient of the Darwin Awards uh, if they, you take that approach to rock climbing. Uh, you wouldn't learn how to fly an airplane that way. You wouldn't learn how to skydive that way. You would hire an instructor. Um, in, those, in those examples, you have to. You're required to by a government person. Um, not so in climbing. Just, you know, and some people make the mistake of thinking, well, then it must not be as dangerous as I think it is because nobody's babysitting me. Not true. The danger is there. Just don't be that person who goes out and exposes yourself to that risk. Hire a professional guide. The first time you go out, the first year that you go out, to be honest, um, we still have this apprenticeship sort of ethic about climbing, um, doing traditional climbs where you're placing your own gear on lead, multi-pitch climbs. Before you do your first multi-pitch climb, if you're smart, you have apprenticed under some good people, whether they're professional guides or just people around town who've got a good reputation as being 20-year veterans of rock climbing. And you literally should be willing to go up to those people and say, hey, can I be the third man on your team? I know you don't really need me to be, but I'll carry your haul bag. I'll haul it up to make sure that it's there for you when you get to the belay ledge. And I won't even climb if you don't let me, right? I'm just willing to haul your bag for you. Do, be willing to do that for about a year, paint that fence like Daniel Son and Karate Kid, and pay your dues with somebody uh, who's good, qualified, and or professional, okay?